Hello, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the History in the Bible podcast. All the history, in all the books, in all the Bibles. Episode 1.51 King Hezekiah, Father of Biblical Religion In the last episode of the History in the Bible, I introduced King Hezekiah of Judah, the monarch who watched in dread as the kingdom of Israel was obliterated by Assyria. The Israelite refugees fleeing into Judah from that calamity transformed his tiny kingdom. Hezekiah's whole reign is the story of how he turned that refugee crisis into an opportunity to secure his monarchy and his state. In doing so, he accidentally became the father of biblical religion. By that I mean, simply, the religion of the Hebrews, as we see it portrayed in the abundantly edited Old Testament that we have today. That religion did not exist when Hezekiah took the throne, much though the Bible wants us to think otherwise. In the last episode of Series 1 of this podcast, I'll present a comprehensive discussion of the development of biblical religion. Hang in there, guys. It's only a few weeks away. One of the first actions attributed to Hezekiah concerns serpents. The book of Numbers, chapter 21, relates how Moses fashioned a copper servant to protect the Israelites. Quote, Numbers 21, 6. The Lord sent poisonous serpents against the people. They bit the people, and many of the Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord to take away the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a figure and mount it on a standard. And if anyone who is bitten looks at it, he shall recover. Moses made a copper serpent and mounted it on a standard. End quote. A thousand years after Numbers was written, the rabbis were disturbed by the magical nature of this cure. They suggested that the snake had nothing to do with it. The victims actually glanced toward God in heaven. They approved of Hezekiah's actions. Quote, 2 Kings 18.4 He abolished the shrines and smashed the pillars and cut down the sacred post. He also broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until that time the, the Israelites had been offering sacrifices to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted only in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those before him. End quote. The temple priests had always been distrustful of the rustics in the countryside. The priests were adamant that God had given them a monopoly over his devotion. You worshipped only at the temple in Jerusalem, a worship that assured a constant stream of sacrificial meat and grain to the priests who ran that temple. The yokels brought sacrifices to shrines on hills and under great trees, shrines often mentioned in the narratives of the patriarchs, but verboten after the building of the temple. The temple priests got no cut from those sacrifices. The priests had complained about the peasants as far back as the founder of Judah, Solomon's son Rehoboam. Quote, 1 Kings 14.21 Meanwhile, Rehoboam had become king in Judah. Judah did what was displeasing to the Lord and angered him more than their fathers had done by the sins that they committed. They too built for themselves shrines, pillars and sacred posts on every high hill and under every leafy tree. There were also male prostitutes in the land. Judah imitated all the abhorrent practices of the nations that the Lord had dispossessed before the Israelites. End quote. Chronicles reports in tedious detail how the temple was cleansed. Quote, 
2 Chronicles 29.3 He opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He summoned the priests and the Levites. He said to them, Listen to me, Levites. Sanctify yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and take the abhorrent things out of the holy place. Then they went into the palace of King Hezekiah and said, We have purified the whole house of the Lord, and all the utensils that King Ahaz had befouled during his reign. When he trespassed, we have made ready and sanctified. They are standing in front of the altar of the Lord. End quote. That was only the beginning. Hezekiah then laid out the second biggest barbecue in history after Noah. Quote, Second Chronicles 29.31 Then Hezekiah said, Now you have consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come, bring sacrifices of well-being and thanksgiving to the house of the Lord. The congregation brought sacrifices of well-being and thanksgiving, and all who felt so moved brought burnt offerings. The number of burnt offerings that the congregation brought was seventy cattle, a hundred rams, two hundred lambs. The sacred offerings were six hundred large cattle and three thousand small cattle. The priests were too few to be able to flay all the burnt offerings. So their kinsmen, the Levites, reinforced them till the end of the work, and till the rest of the priests sanctified themselves. End quote. Second biggest barbecue? Hezekiah was about to exceed himself. He invited the remnants of the kingdom of Israel, now an Assyrian province, to celebrate Passover and the festival of unleavened bread in Jerusalem. Quote, Second Chronicles 29.24 King Hezekiah of Judah contributed to the congregation a thousand bulls and seven thousand sheep. And the officers contributed to the congregation a thousand bulls and ten thousand sheep. All the congregation of Judah and the priests and the Levites and all the congregation that came from Israel and the resident aliens who came from the land of Israel and who lived in Judah rejoiced. There was great rejoicing in Jerusalem, for since the time of King Solomon, son of David of Israel, nothing like it had happened in Jerusalem. The Levite priests rose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer went up to his holy abode, to heaven. End quote. According to the chronicler, Hezekiah is Judah's greatest religious reformer, the man who finally stamps out all the remnant Canaanite nonsense. Nonsense that had been tolerated even by Moses and Solomon. We have some reason to doubt that. In the past 20 years, archaeologists have turned up a number of clay seals belonging to Hezekiah. The seals show a winged sun or winged scarab, surrounded by two anks. These are Assyrian and Egyptian symbols, not Jewish ones. Few commentators have pointed out that those seals show no evidence of Hezekiah's dedication to Yahweh. Quite the opposite. In 713 BC, nine years after the refugee crisis, and halfway through Hezekiah's reign, the Philistine city of Ashdod rebelled against Assyria. From an inscription by the Assyrian king Sargon II, it seems that Judah was implicated in some way in the revolt. Quote, Azuri king of Ashdod plotted in his heart to withhold his tribute and sent messages of hostility to the kings round about him, to the kings of Philistia, Judah, Edom, Moab, who dwelt by the sea, payers of tribute to Assyria, he sent numberless inflammatory messages to set them at enmity with me. To Pharaoh, king of Egypt, a prince who could not save them, they sent presents to gain him as an ally. End quote. The prophet Isaiah takes it upon himself to advise Hezekiah on foreign policy. He reminds the king not to trust in foreign alliances 
especially with those weakling Egyptians. Long quote. Isaiah 21. It was the year King Sargon of Assyria attacked Ashdod and took it. Previously, Yahweh had spoken to Isaiah, saying, Go, untie the sackcloth from your loins, and take your sandals off your feet, which he had done, going naked and barefoot. And now, Yahweh said, it is a sign and a portent for Egypt and Nubia. Just as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot for three years, so shall the king of Assyria drive off the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Nubia, young and old, naked and barefoot, and with bared buttocks, to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be dismayed and chagrined, because of Nubia their hope, and Egypt their boast. In that day the dwellers of this coastland shall say, If this could happen to those we looked to, to whom we fled for help and rescue from the king of Assyria, how can we ourselves escape? End quote. The prophet Isaiah parades around naked and barefoot as a sign act to symbolize the weakness of Egypt and the Cushites in failing to protect Ashdod. Isaiah hates any idea of allying with foreigners, but he really has it in for the Egyptians. Not because they are a wicked bunch, just untrustworthy. Quote, Isaiah 31.1 Ha! Those who go down to Egypt for help and rely upon horses, they have put their trust in abundance of chariots, in vast numbers of riders, and they have not turned to the Holy One of Israel, they have not sought Yahweh. For the Egyptians are man, not God, and their horses are flesh, not spirit. And when Yahweh stretches out his arm, the helper shall trip, and the helped one shall fall, and both shall perish together. End quote. Isaiah was dead right about that. Egypt would prove useless to the Judean kingdom. Ashdod's rebellion had no consequences for Hezekiah, but the king was very, very worried. Isaiah's insistence that Judah could never be conquered did not allay his fears. Sensible man. Hezekiah made plans against the day the Assyrians turned against the royal city. He overhauled the state's administration and amassed reserves of grain, wine and oil. He made a tunnel through the bedrock to bring the water of an outside spring to a protected pool within the city, known today as the Pool of Siloam. Quote, 2 Chronicles 32.3 He consulted with his officers and warriors about stopping the flow of the springs outside the city, and they supported him. A large force was assembled to stop up all the springs and the wadi that flowed through the land. For otherwise, they thought, the king of Assyria would come and find water in abundance. He acted with vigour, rebuilding the whole breached wall, raising towers on it, and building another wall outside it. He made a great quantity of arms and shields. He appointed battle officers over the people. Then, gathering them to him in the square of the city gate, he rallied them, saying, Be strong and of good courage. Do not be frightened or dismayed by the king of Assyria. For we have more with us than he has with him. With him is an arm of flesh. But with us is Yahweh our God, to help us and to fight our battles. End quote. Sargon II died in 705 BC. As so often happened on the death of an Assyrian king, the empire broke into open revolt. The Assyrians never really understood the concept of stable government. Sargon's son Sennacherib spent the first few years of his reign dealing with the insurrection of Marduk Apla Edina in Assyria's wealthiest province, Babylon. It was probably at this time that the Babylonians sent envoys to Hezekiah. The same story is presented in 2 Kings chapter 20 and Isaiah 39. Let's go with Kings. Quote, 
2 Kings 2012. At that time, King Baradoc Baladan of Babylon sent envoys with a letter and a gift to Hezekiah. Hezekiah heard about them, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fragrant oil, and his armory, and everything that was to be found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his palace, or in all his realm, that Hezekiah did not show them. End quote. Isaiah thought that was a terrible idea. Hezekiah had let the Babylonians case the joint. Quote, 2 Kings 2014 Then the prophet Isaiah came to King Hezekiah. What, he demanded of him, did those men say to you? Where have they come to you from? They have come, Hezekiah replied, from a far country, from Babylon. Next he asked, What have they seen in your palace? And Hezekiah replied, They have seen everything that is in my palace. There was nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. A time is coming when everything in your palace, which your ancestors have stored up to this day, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will remain behind, said the Lord. And some of your sons, your own issue, whom you will have fathered, will be taken to serve as eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. End quote. According to Kings, Hezekiah breathes a sigh of relief at this dreadful prophecy. Quote, 2 Kings 2019 Hezekiah declared to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, It means that safety is assured for my time. End quote. I can't believe that is what Hezekiah really thought. He has spent years in the service of his kingdom, deftly handing a massive influx of refugees, building new infrastructure, and reconstructing his entire religious apparatus. This is a man who is looking far into the future, not a man just trying to live through tomorrow. In his last years, in 701 BC, Hezekiah faced his greatest crisis. The Assyrian king Sennacherib had spent a few years tidying up matters after the death of his father, Sargon II. And by tidying up, I mean beating the living daylights out of the ever-fractious province of Babylon. Some of the Levantine states, ever hopeful that this was finally the end of Assyria, launched their own mutinies. The Egyptians egged them on without lifting a finger in actual support. Judah was caught up in the rebellious excitement. Quote, 2 Kings 18.13 In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria marched against all the fortified towns of Judah and seized them. King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria. I have done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I shall bear whatever you impose on me. So the king of Assyria imposed upon King Hezekiah of Judah a payment of 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was on hand in the house of Yahweh and in the treasuries of the palace. At that time Hezekiah cut down the doors and the doorposts of the temple of Yahweh, which King Hezekiah had overlaid with gold, and gave them to the king of Assyria. End quote. Chronicles and the book of Isaiah say nothing about this. The great treasures of temple and state, gathered by David and Solomon, did not long survive their passing. The Egyptians had despoiled the temple a few years after Solomon's death in 926 BC. The Arameans had taken more under King Ben-Hadad 20 years later. Tiglath-Pileser III extracted an extortionate sum from Hezekiah's father, Ahaz. The temple was now despoiled for a fourth time. But Sennacherib pressed on. He wanted more. He wanted Jerusalem. In one of the Bible's great set pieces, 
Sennacherib's royal spokesman, addresses the Judeans manning the walls of the holy city. He speaks in Hebrew, not the intellectual lingua franca of Aramaic, so that the soldiers and people can understand. Long quote. 2 Kings 18.19 Sennacherib's royal spokesman said to them, You tell Hezekiah, Thus said the great king, the king of Assyria, What makes you so confident? You rely, of all things, on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff, which enters and punctures the palm of anyone who leans on it. That's what Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is like to all who rely on him. The court officials replied, Please, speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in Judean, in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the spokesman answered them, Was it to your master and to you that my master sent me to speak those words? It was precisely to the men who were sitting on the wall, who will have to eat their dung and drink their urine with you. And the spokesman stood and called out in Judean, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Don't let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely save us. This city will not fall into the hands of the king of Assyria. For thus said the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me, and come out to me, so that you may all eat from your vines and your fig trees, and drink water from your cisterns. Don't listen to Hezekiah, who misleads you by saying, The Lord will save us. Did any of the gods of other nations save his land from the king of Assyria? End quote. At this point, Hezekiah consults Isaiah again. The prophet quite accurately predicts that Sennacherib shall not take Jerusalem. That's very comforting for the one in ten Judeans who live inside the fabled city, but gives no succor to the nine in ten living in the countryside. According to the Bible, the Assyrians were cut down. Quote, 2 Kings 19.32 Assuredly, thus said Yahweh concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not enter this city. I will protect and save this city for my sake, and for the sake of my servant David. That night an angel of Yahweh went out and struck down 185,000 in the Assyrian camp, and in the following morning they were all dead corpses. End quote. We have Sennacherib's account of the struggle on three artefacts called prisms of red-baked clay, shaped like the vase your 14-year-old made in their fifth pottery class. They stand 40 centimetres high by 15 centimetres wide, a little over one foot by six inches. They were unearthed in the early 19th century. The prisms contain six paragraphs of cuneiform written in Akkadian. Here is how the Assyrian king describes his campaign. Quote, As to Hezekiah, the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to his strong cities, walled forts, and countless small villages, and conquered them. I drove out 200,150 people, young and old, male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, big and small cattle beyond counting, and considered them slaves. Himself I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with earthwork in order to molest those who were on his city's gate. Thus I reduced his country, but I still increased the tribute and the presence to me as overlord which I imposed upon him. Beyond the former tribute, to be delivered annually. Hezekiah himself did send me later to Nineveh, my lordly city, together with thirty talents of gold, eight hundred talents of silver, precious stones, and timony, large cuts of red stone, couches inlaid with ivory, elephant hides, ebony wood, boxwood, and all kinds of valuable treasures, his own daughters and concubines. End quote. What Sennacherib does not mention 
is his failure to take the city of Jerusalem itself. Hezekiah's preparations for a siege had worked. He paid great tribute, but the city was saved. Outside of Jerusalem, the story was not so happy. Great swathes of Judah were devastated. Sennacherib marched through the Shephelah, the coastal plain between the Philistine cities and the central hill country of Judah. Every site in the Shephelah and the Beersheba Valley in the northern Negev reveals evidence of destruction. The Shephelah, the breadbasket of Judah, never recovered. Hezekiah was left to rule a smaller but more crowded kingdom. Early in his reign, 20 years before, Israelite refugees had swollen Hezekiah's tiny realm from 25,000 to 120,000 souls. After the Assyrian depredations, he could now count perhaps 75,000 subjects. Hezekiah had made a reckless decision to rebel against Assyria, and he paid for it. The author of Kings makes a special effort to hide the fact that the kingdom of Judah remained under Assyrian domination many years after the miraculous rescue of the single city of Jerusalem from Sennacherib. In the next episode of The History in the Bible, I tackle the many complexities of the first superstar prophet and Hezekiah's foreign policy advisor, Isaiah. Thanks for listening.